because it's the one I believe is the more important one, which is fructose. Some of the evidence that I would cite just at a very superficial level to support the idea that if we're worried about the increasing frequency of gout, and it is more frequent, then how do we square that curve? How do we reconcile that with the fact that red meat consumption has been going down generally and fish consumption has always been really low? Well, then how do we how do we reconcile that? If one of these variables is going down or at the best staying flat, how can the other one be going up? There must be something else that explains it. And indeed, I think that something else is fructose, the consumption of which has been increasing for decades. Now let's talk about fructose then. So fructose is absorbed in the intestine and it is moved into the body and it goes to the liver. And the liver is uniquely suited to metabolize fructose because of the, the transporters that allow it to bring in the fructose and as well as the enzyme expression enabling it to break it down. So unlike glucose, when, when, you, have, when you have these monosaccharides, these simplest unit of the sugar, glucose and fructose, when they come into a cell, they each have their own sort of respective pathway that they're going to go down. Fructose, in order to be metabolized, glucose is heavily regulated. These steps are intricately sensitive and responsive to the overall energetic milieu of the cell. So if the cell has a lot of energy, let's think about the liver. If the liver cell has a lot of energy, it can take that um, where it's burning a lot of glucose already, that high level of glucose burning will basically start to feed back and tell the liver cell, hey, we're burning a lot of glucose right now. So let's divert that glucose into something else. So it has some regulatory steps that will check its own metabolism. However, fructose bypasses the main regulatory step of glucose, which is an enzyme called phosphofructokinase, PFK. Now, PFK has some different varieties, but PFK, phosphofructokinase, is, the, is one of the more sensitive steps in the burning of glucose that allows the cell to decide what it wants to do with glucose. But again, fructose bypasses that. It does not have, it doesn't have to listen to the signal coming from phosphofructokinase like glucose does. This means that the liver cell is able to metabolize fructose at a much, much higher rate, essentially unchecked compared to glucose levels. Now then within the liver, um, as the fructose is getting metabolized, it's getting acted on by an enzyme called fructokinase or sometimes called ketohexokinase. Now that has nothing to do with ketone bodies, but rather uh, it's more of a term of specific chemistry where there's a ketone bond within these molecules. So let's just call it fructokinase um, to avoid any potential confusion. So this fructokinase enzyme turns the fructose into an enzyme into a molecule called fructose 1-phosphate. But whenever you have a molecule that has gone from one form to a phosphate form or a phosphorylated form, it has to it has to have used ATP in order to do that. So fructokinase will grab the fructose molecule. It will grab an ATP molecule and mesh them together, one of the phosphates at least from the ATP, and give rise to fructose 1-phosphate. But that means that what, what was an ATP with three phosphates, adenosine triphosphate, has become broken down, lo having lost one phosphate, and now it's adenosine diphosphate, ADP. And this reaction just keeps happening. We keep just breaking ATP just to handle the fructose load because we are metabolizing so much fructose and essentially the liver can't stop. There's no way for it to regulate its own fructose burning. The net effect of this is that as we start to try to recreate ATP in order to continue to fuel the fructokinase reaction, we end up getting a lot of a molecule called AMP adenosine monophosphate, AMP. That is an important development in this process. When we start to get a lot of, a, a lot of AMP, now we're just a couple steps away from um, uh, the uric acid because AMP starts to turn through a series of events and I'll spare you. You're already thinking I'm getting too specific. I could be a lot more specific. 
where the AMP is now basically turning, breaking down through a few steps back into xanthine, which you recall because I just mentioned it, and then give xanthine another step and it's turned into uric acid. So we've now completed this journey. Again, where the fructose, just to recount it, perhaps with some degree of brevity, the liver can't stop burning fructose. There's no way to really turn it off, unlike other metabolic pathways. And this means that the liver cell is burning through a lot of ATP. And through the course of trying to continue to recreate ATP, we end up getting a lot of AMP. And then the AMP, after a handful of metabolic steps, becomes uric acid. This, I think, is the singular pathway mattering more than any other when it comes to explaining why the liver cell in particular is pumping out, is creating so much uric acid. Like gangbusters, it can't stop. The more fructose coming in the mouth in whatever form, whether it's fruit juice or, or sugar or high fructose corn syrup, is going to give rise to more uric acid production by necessity. All those molecules of fructose you just can't stop burning gives rise to a lot of uric acid. Before I move on to the final part, I should encourage, I need to encourage all of you, if this is a topic that you're getting more and more interested in, I strongly recommend you look up the work of Dr. Rick Johnson, a friend and colleague, colleague in research and collaborator that I'll share the project we're doing in a moment. But he has written a book called The Fat Switch, or Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. And it's all about how then the uric acid, as it accumulates, starts to drive more hunger and then ends up becoming a primary contributor to obesity in the long term.